Mio Drag is an architect and urbanist. He's an associate professor at the Parsons School of Design. He previously served as a dean of the School of Design Strategies at Parsons, and he was also uh, previously a chair of urban and transdisciplinary design. Miodrag Mistrazinovich's research focuses on the infrastructural dimensions of public space and what he calls its generative capacity. He is the author of many papers and at least three books. Uh, the last one of his books is a collective edited volume. Its title is Concurrent Urbanities, Designing Infrastructures of Inclusion. We asked him to present the core of its argument, that is, the responsibility of the urban designers to engage both critically and practically in the production of more inclusive, more democratic public spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's also really uh, an exciting moment, I understand, from even the couple of conversations we had prior to uh, the, the beginning of the event. Um, it, there is an excitement and there is a, um, a really beautiful atmosphere in which uh, these early conversations are taking place. Uh, and I do recognize the excitement. Uh, I did share a little bit of uh, of optimism and a little bit of skepticism with some of you before, uh, because as Patrick said, also there are, there are it's a, it's a beautiful thing to do. There are many, of course, possibilities to uh, fail, but since I kind of represent then the world of design uh, in design school, we never say that anyone fails, and there is no we never say at least I don't say to a student that they ever make a mistake. Um, I just don't. Maybe that's why you know they like me. But the reason why I don't, the reason why I don't, because in the process of designing, we believe that, of course, there is a process of iteration, process of prototyping, testing, trying, and in that, every mistake really is just a step towards uh, a more, uh, a different trajectory through your thinking and through the project. Uh, so, uh, I will be happy to uh, continue the conversation uh, after this and, of course, uh, hopefully uh, later on. Uh, as I said, uh, if nothing else, it's because it's, uh, uh, we have been going through a very similar process uh, in the last 10 years or so. And, in fact, it was uh, Professor Bruno Latour who came to visit the new school uh, some five years ago uh, when we started some of the graduate programs and, at that point, uh, the provost Arjuna Padurai and then Ben Lee and other faculty invited him over to uh, basically to see, uh, to see what is going on and to figure out if our experiment was succeeding or failing. Um, and it was uh, very interesting that in fact, we wanted to learn from him, but he said, no, 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 no. So he didn't speak at all. He said, just you speak. Uh, he wanted to uh, figure out what was going on there. And we did for five days. <laughs> um, so, uh, I will, uh, Mathieu asked me to talk about, uh, he gave me, basically he gave me the synopsis of my talk, which is always very good. Uh, he asked me to cover a lot of points, and I don't know how am I going to do that in 45 minutes, but I will try. And so the first thing Mathieu asked me to do is to basically to really almost kind of follow the way in which I structured the book, uh, which is to say the first story is the story uh, about uh, what happens in New York City in between um, 2002-2014, during the um, uh, period of uh, Mayor uh, Michael Bloomberg, shown here on the, uh, uh, the High Line. Uh, I, I will briefly mention the High Line and try to run through this as, soon as, uh, as quickly as possible, just to get to uh, the role design plays, I believe, in the production of uh, a participatory, uh, democratic, and inclusive uh, urban space. So what happened to uh, New York in 2002 is that the New York elected uh, my, uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg as mayor, who did uh, uh, some really good things for the city, there's no doubt about it, but uh, it turned out that his understanding of how the city works and how the city ought to work was at odds with a lot of uh, uh, citizens. Um, who, through his mayorship, became disenfranchised, marginalized, displaced, deterior deteriorized, dispossessed, and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, what he, one of the projects that everyone knows, and I am not going to, uh, as I said, I'm not going to go into details on it, is this Highline project that then became linked to one, uh, the, the largest real estate development deal in the United States history, and that's the, uh, by a single developer, I'm sorry, and that's the Hudson Yards. 
The first thing that, uh, the first project talking about urban planning, the first project that uh, uh, Bloomberg's planning uh, uh, office did is to rezone over, over a longer period of time uh, nearly 40% of land across the five boroughs. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, you can see, in fact, most of the orange, there are a couple of shades of orange, but most of the orange are basically the rezoned territories across the city. And you can see that much of the waterfront has been rezoned, all the industrial facilities have been rezoned, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the reasons for this development, for the rezoning, is, was simply to create new economic opportunities uh, and to, uh, therefore, bring life and dollars into the city's budget uh, through international investment and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the project, uh, the Highline project started as, uh, as most people know it, anecdotally and otherwise, started by a couple of uh, uh, relatively young people, entrepreneurs, who basically uh, uh, were appalled by the mistreatment of the uh, a, um, um, falling apart, uh, obsolete piece of infrastructure, and that's the, the Highline. Uh, which was uh, at some point a vibrant, dynamic part of the city uh, and transferred, of course, goods and, um, and uh, finished products across the west side uh, of Manhattan. Um, at some point, of course, uh, when they start uh, uh, beginning to engage in the process, you know, municipal policy, politics, uh, the mayor's office, and so on and so forth, to make a long story short, over time, suddenly uh, the project begins to boom, and not only that, but the project begins to attract uh, a lot of uh, uh, private, a lot of public funding, even including federal funding. Uh, that was quite a puzzling event. And the reason why that was puzzling is because this was actually a, apparently a local project uh, which was supposed to, in fact, also um, boost uh, the, uh, the economic vitality of, the, of this particular uh, part of the city. And before anyone really knew it, the new buildings began to emerge there. The New York Times called this area a area of uh, lively architecture or architectural theme park, because many argued in architectural circles that this is the first time that actually New York City is beginning to have some architecture. Because most people argue that there is no architecture in New York City, there is a lot of this and that, but not really, nothing really interesting to see for those who were, as architects, interested in looking at buildings. So there are architects who are not only interested in buildings, but you know, for those who were interested in new buildings, there was not much to see. Needless to say, before you knew it, there was a standard hotel on your right by Paul Sheck and Partners, um, Neil Denaris, new housing uh, uh, scheme. These are the, some of the buildings, Frank Gehry, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, and of course, on the left, I always ask, uh, who do you think designed the building on the left? And of course, in 99%, everyone knows who designed the building on the left. Zaha Hadid, right, of course. Uh, there's no way to miss it. And, and there, is a, there is a good reason for that. And I think that one thing that uh, really happened to those who live in New York, who actually never go to the High Line, because it became a tourist attraction, is that the, the High Line really began, particularly for those of us who were really interested in, the, in a way in which this is going to develop a new attitude towards New York City as it was advertised, is that high, high Line, I'm gonna sound, this is gonna sound like a very Marxist critique, but nevertheless, High Line really, in fact, contributed to the commodification of urban experience. There is no doubt about it. And then, in fact, what it did, it framed urban experience, particularly along the High Line, it framed it in ways in which New York City, in ways that were not known to New York City before. Um, much of the uh, 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 public was actually surprised when they learned that, in fact, High Line is only a part of a larger project that uh, you can see here, that then begins to go around right here and over here, because, in fact, High Line adds to 34th Street. Uh, and so what you see here is the, uh, are the trains, the MTA uh, train depot, uh, that actually the land is owned by MTA, and much of this land also in the process of rezoning was rezoned in order to facilitate a number of different projects. There was an Olympic, when New York City placed a bid for Olympic uh, Games, he didn't get them, but that was the, the, supposed to be the site of the large stadium, and so on and so forth. And finally, this becomes, uh, under construction now, uh, the largest development in the history of the United States by a single developer after Rockefeller Center. 
the, you know, there are speculations as to how much this actually is going to cost, but in fact, my argument is, an argument of many, is that it, it even doesn't even matter, and as we know from experience, in most of the cases, it is really nearly impossible even to calculate, in fact, what is the actual cost of this, of this project. And as you know, in many of the projects of this kind across the globe, of course, there are 14 acres of public space. We know what kind of public space that is. There are, of course, uh, office towers, the anchor stores, the uh, luxury residences, and so on and so forth. And of course, the idea of affordable housing in this particular development, as then now insisted by, uh, by the new mayor, uh, is completely, uh, has completely disappeared. What is really interesting by, by this is that when you look at the budget that, uh, that uh, uh, Bloomberg inherited, the deficit in the budget that Bloomberg inherited, which was all $3 billion in 2000 and, uh, 2002, he leaves office with the surplus of $2.4 billion. So he inherits a $3 billion deficit and he leaves the office with $2.4 billion uh, surplus. But what happens to that, in fact, in the meantime, and I detail that in the book, is that, of course, the number of homeless, the number of uh, affordable housing goes down, the number of homeless goes up, the number of, pe of people living uh, below, below poverty line goes up. So when you see the results of this uh, operation, then you begin to understand that something is not quite right. How is it possible that a city that goes from $3 billion minus to $2.4 billion plus in 12 years it creates such a degree of inequality. Everyone was puzzled by it. In fact, in many ways, that's why uh, the new mayor won the race, because he argued that this, there is a tale of two cities going on, and there, it's impossible that under such prosperity, we have managed to create such, an, such inequality, such unknown degrees of inequality, right? And the reason then, uh, uh, one of the books I really like, uh, uh, Julian Brash's book on the, on, uh, the Bloomberg Way, uh, Bloomberg's New York is the title of the book, uh, in fact claims that uh, the reason why is because the, news, the, the model of governance that we have, we, I mean people living in New York, have experienced through Bloomberg's administration is the typical, the, the uh, epitome of the neoliberal governance. And he says in this model, of course, what we see now for the first time is the city de facto for New Yorkers has become uh, tour de force of capital accumulation, which we know already from theory and practice and so on and so forth, but this becomes very evident to every single citizen, and, uh, uh, and of course the tour de force of the, of, uh, uh, the uh, modes of uh, uh, supreme, uh, creating supreme surplus values. In this particular model, the Bloomberg way, as uh, uh, Brash names it, mayor is cast as a CEO, uh, city government as a corporation, uh, businesses as clients, citizens as, as customers, and city as the product. Uh, what that does, in fact, is uh, uh, obvious to all of us, particularly to this particular thing, to this uh, example, and I will run through it. Uh, what brings, uh, what brings uh, the people to this particular site, because there is no line that reaches this site right now, is the extension of, of nine, uh, line number seven. Line number seven in New York City is called the Immigrant Express, and basically connects the end of Queens with this side. So this is one side, and the other side is the end of Queens, flushing, right? The line number seven costed two and a half billion dollars to be extended, and it was extended from Times Square to this site, literally under the site. And so a lot of people said, well, wait a minute, I mean, so why would you extend line number seven to this site? Well, there is, you know, tourists are traveling, da, da, da. But in fact, again, this may sound as a Marxist critique, but it is the part of this calculation. This is the open ceremony, the opening, and so on and so forth. You're on this map, for those of you who don't know, so we're talking about this here, so the line number seven is gonna be here, and it goes all the way to Washington over here. And so what you see basically there is that what you see there, these are the images of that other city. I'll have to skip because there's no time, but this is basically the life uh, along number seven. This is the, the, this is the, these are the spaces, this is train number seven. On, the, on, the, on your right is the picture from Flushing, so if you don't speak Chinese over there, you can hardly order lunch. Um, along number seven, and that's a true story, it's not, it's not an exaggeration. Uh, the, uh, along number, line number seven, because 40% of people living in New York City today are immigrants who were born elsewhere and have moved to the city uh, after 1990. 40, so that's over 3 million people. Uh, 3.7, I believe, million people. More than, so there are more immigrants born elsewhere living in New York City today than there are citizens of Chicago. So that's the comparison, right? 
And so many of them, most of them, a great majority, lives along line, line number seven and also lines B and Q, right? Needless to say, I mean, why? Because those are the places that uh, have no capital flow in them, they have, they have no municipal services, and they have, no, they have seen no improvement under, under Mayor Bloomberg, of course. These are some of the images from there. So but what is really interesting about this uh, uh, is the role that design plays in, the, in this vision of neoliberal city. And the reason why I say that is because uh, usually for, for m much or many of the design professionals, design anyway is seen as a formal and material practice. In rare occasions, I have to say that being an architect, and in rare occasions you will understand uh, there are people in schools, particularly schools and programs, who also design, understand design as social, symbolic, and occasionally cultural activity. But mo in most cases, design ends up being a material activity. And in fact, it is really interesting that after this particular model, in fact, design is employed precisely as it, as it if you look at the design, mainstream design schools, as it should be. And design is as employed as a form-giving practice that follows fear, uh, finance, the accumulation, the, the logic of capital accumulation, and very often, in fact, uh, ends up in the types of buildings we saw before. That's why you can all recognize Zaha Hadid's building. It not, it's not because she cannot design a different building. It's because she designs Zaha Hadid buildings, just like you can recognize Neil Denari's building, and so on and so forth. It's the logic of the marketplace. It's the logic of how these buildings participate in the cycles of the production of urban space and economic opportunity. That their role is defined as formal, and therefore we can all recognize who they are and what they represent. But more than that, in fact, uh, this may sound now a little bit up, up, away from uh, Marx towards Foucault. But um, uh, joking aside, uh, more, uh, more than this, design is uh, employed as a disciplinary technology. And, and it's, it's employed as disciplinary technology precisely because it is supposed to facilitate the uh, capital uh, accumulation and it's supposed to uh, uh, achieve a, an application of capital which is strategic and differentiated. And this is how design, in fact, works. Uh, if you look at the, what the Bloomberg administration did, you will see that this is not just design as in product design or graphic design, or it's architecture, it's urban planning, it's interior design, it's public art, it's all of this that goes under a very large rubric of public art and design. Um, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, I will have to move on, but what I wanted to, see, uh, what I wanted to say one more thing is uh, my favorite uh, line from Sharon Zukin's work, is that uh, this uh, vision of urbanity is based also on a vision of civility which is bound by consumption. So in other words, everything that isn't necessarily bound to consumption and commodification will not succeed in this system. Now, when you go to um, uh, the end of Queens, for example, or Brooklyn, or Rockaway, or any of the places that have seen really no improvement under, under the last 15 years and more, particularly more, um, what you, it's not all Bloomberg's fault, let me just make that clear. Um, what you see, in fact, that there is a lot of activity, a lot of dynamic and vibrant communities that have, with artists and designers, working and creating value. Social value, cultural value, shared value, right? And so even though there is no flow of money, there, is, there are no resources, there are no funds, people find ways. And you find, you know, urban agriculture, you have fine farming, you, you find uh, uh, po um, um, school programs, you find uh, graffiti programs, you find all kinds of things, shared kitchens and so on and so forth, all kinds of things where a certain uh, amount of creativity, creative intelligence, uh, uh, group working, group critique is in fact succeeding. So what I was, what I try to do, now this is going to be, I apologize in advance, the, the room of, full of social scientists, and I'm going to talk about civil society as an architect. But nevertheless, I will try to do that. I tried it with a friend of mine from CUNY the other day, and she said, for an architect, this is not that bad. <laughs> so, you know, let me try, and I'll hope I'll stay alive through this. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do is to understand then how design employed differently through non-commodified forms of practice can actually contribute to the build-up of alternatives. For, for, uh, since I'm interested in build-up of alternatives, I'm obviously interested in some form of economic parity. I'm interested in socio-spatial justice. I'm interested in the ways in which people can actually find the way of surviving collectively under the pressures 
of, econo of the economic system that is basically pushing them further and further and further away, right? For that, my vehicle of get getting there is to figure out how, in fact, design can begin to work strategically and tactically to, co to begin to connect very much along the lines of what uh, Patrick was sketching out, how can it begin to work as a connective tissue or as a, even in some cases as a modality of governance? In fact, in creating connectivities in between the state and the, uh, the, the state agencies, state organizations, and so on and so forth, the, the marketplace, meaning private business of any scale and any kind, and entrepreneurship, and the, 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 uh, what uh, you may call the civil society or the space of civil society, but the space that it's, I, t I borrowed the definition from um, Iris Mar Marion Young, uh, and the definition of civil society as a space that is based on voluntary participation, that is activity-based and process-based, uh, uh, activity and process-based space, right? And so what I'm trying to figure out is how in this particular scheme, she, for those of you who know her work, she builds on a number of people, Arato and Cohen and Habermas and Fraser and Muff and so on and so forth, and tries to combine them all somehow. And what I'm taking from her is basically three as associational activities that are very important for designers, not for social scientists, sorry, to understand, in order to understand where their contribution can be situated. And I will tell you uh, uh, later on why this is important in design school particularly. And so I take the private, or the private associational type, the civic and the, and the public, and I try to figure out, in fact, how through the practices I talk about, the book is an edited volume, it has 12 authors who all, all write about their ways of doing this, how, in fact, design begins to, to act as a connector in between these organizations, build the capacity for self-organizing, Take, uh, 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 scale it up to uh, the creation of um, uh, ide uh, social identities, voices, and take it into the, sp the public realm as a, political, uh, uh, as a political voice, as a political idea. And how then, through this work of uh, bridging the, the, the top-down the top and bottom-up, in fact, as Chantal Mouffe would have it, political begins to emerge. In other words, how the conflict, the urban conflict that is... Uh, more than evident across the world today, in fact, when operationalized, begins to, in fact, be a tissue we can work with in order to begin to connect uh, the institutions, organizations, people, individuals, communities that are not connected otherwise at all. Um, so I look at design as a tactical practice and a strategic practice. So uh, I will show you then a couple of examples later, uh, just after I define these so that you can follow through the examples. So I look at design as a tactical practice and as a tactical level, I see design broadly construed, broadly construed. Design as a catalyst for building dispositions and capacities for self-organization in urban communities and among citizens, and I take this urban citizens, not citizens as in national citizens, but urban citizens out of uh, Holston and Padurai's work, urban citizens where such capacities are not present, and how they work towards disambiguation, in other words, towards mobilization and conceptualization of the new emerging forms of urban practice and knowledge that no one takes into account. One-offs, little, little innovation happening in some community, how do you actually codify it, how do you mobilize it, how do you actually make it transferable to other places and other communities that do not possess that kind of talent or opportunity. And then as a strategic practice, I see design employed as a vehicle for building Capabilities for action by aggregating, aggregating, synergizing, and coordinating existing initiatives and scaling them up, which is an extremely important uh, uh, type of work that designers have been engaged in. Uh, uh, the designer designers uh, empower the capabilities of third sector organizations. Sometimes it's not the designers and professionals. It is the notion of the diffuse design in which uh, organizations themselves acquire some design capacities so that they can, in fact, do the work uh, on their own. And how design adds strategic capability to state and government agencies by enabling connectivities now that have not existed before uh, in between, needless to say, civil society, uh, uh, community-based organizations and the uh, state organizations and eventually, of course, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the marketplace. Uh, one, of the, one of the practices that uh, uh, is represented in the book is uh, Stalker from uh, Rome. Uh, Lorenzo Romito uh, wrote the chapter. And their work is really interesting because what they do for 15 years now, 10 years, sorry, for 10 years now, 
is uh, their practice of connecting and building capacity is through walking. And so what you see here, in fact, first of all, this is a map of Rome underneath. These, is, these are the organizations, community-based citizen organizations, associations, coalitions that are connected into the network they're building. The lines actually literally are the, the walks that they make with the members of all of these organizations across the city. And the reason why they walk is because they want people to understand the geography and the topography of the region they inhabit, right? And so because in most cases, this actually the grounding, the practice of grounding and connecting is something that is completely lost in most urban settings. The anecdotal, also the transfer of anecdotal knowledge. Um, this, this, these are some of the photographs from what they, from what they do. And Lorenzo actually was running for the mayor of Rome last year, of course, he didn't win, but the point was not really to become a mayor of Rome, the point was to actually activate uh, the network, to scale it up, and this is what they do. They basically walk, literally walk across the city, and they walk uh, across this, what they call the actual territories, uh, territories that are completely uh, disenfranchised and marginalized, and basically by doing that, they begin to build the capacity of these people, they get to know each other and so on and so forth, to begin to self-organize around the shared ideas of how this shared urban space, city of Rome, can actually be governed or, or organized in a more equitable and more um, um, uh, manage manageable ways. Uh, this is a Campo Bora, Boario, a project uh, they did in the Kurdish camp in Rome, uh, which, is, uh, which I don't have the time to describe, but it's an incredible project. And the reason for this work, they basically worked with the Kurdish community in the camp to create an installation that then was um, uh, uh, basically uh, commissioned and generated economic income for this community. And the, this, uh, the thinking about creating economic capacity by also creating economic opportunity is very simple. I do believe that we, you cannot, we cannot even talk, begin to talk about participation in a context of structural injustice in which there is not even a rough economic parity. So if you, if you have no economic parity, there is no participation. Who is going to participate? There is no dialogue, right? So in order to create uh, the culture of dialogue, in order to create participation, in order to link things or people to each other, there needs to be at least a rough economic parity. So the work of designers by cre creating economic opportunities at the community level is extremely important, and this project uh, proved that, because it simply enables people who not, to now at least have some means within which they can be given to, to think about something else besides surviving on a daily basis. Um, the other one, uh, designers as theories of urban transformation, I will again try to run through this. This is a DESIS laboratory started by um, uh, Ezio Manzini, Professor Ezio Manzini from Mil Milan Politecnico. Uh, it stands for Design for Social Innovation and Sustainability. Uh, and so DESIS labs are now uh, across the world. This particular one is New York based. Uh, Lara Penin and Eduardo Stasovsky. They received a grant from Rockefeller Foundation to actually do this project called Amplify. And basically what they were trying to figure out is how they can recognize the uh, innovation that happens, com communal innovation that happens at the communal level across the city and how this, the, the body of knowledge created through that per to a particular project or set of actions can be codified and then, as I said before, and then transferred, mobilized to other places that may need that kind of knowledge in order to get to um, uh, either political participation or economic opportunity, just like uh, the ones where they recognize them. One of the things they recognized immediately is community gardens in New York. They they, they, they back to the 60s and they uh, brought the people who actually started, the anarchists from the 60s who actually started the movement and managed to change the top-down policy so that now community garden, creation of community gardens is a regular thing in New York City. These are some of the images from, the, from the, those they studied in Lower East Side at first. And what they did is then, I want to uh, bring this uh, notion of participation in design now through their work. What they did is they did, uh, uh, they worked with uh, sociologists, with uh, ethnographers, and they uh, did a lot of interviews, they did video interviews, they did observations, they did all kinds of things for, for, for a year. And then they basically began to, began to cross-reference that body of knowledge and they, uh, of uh, research, and they, are, they identified major themes they need to focus on. I don't have the time to explain, but this is, this is what important. What they did then is they, in fact, uh, uh, rented a space, a local community uh, space, and they uh, organized workshops, which were basically studios, right? 
And they organized them a couple of times a week. And through these studios, they brought a number of variety of actors, as you say, actors, uh, a number of actors and agencies and organizations who were involved in the community garden project to basically figure out how this knowledge, they, they use the word brokering, how that knowledge can be brokered. In other words, how you can begin suddenly to understand through the processes of engagement how they did it. Um, one thing that uh, um, Patrick uh, uh, also talked about, re research for research, one thing that is really interesting for, in our experience when we begin to talk across was that most of the design faculty said, you know, uh, oh, this, uh, you know, the social scientists, uh, uh, you know, they're only interested in analysis. But the social scientists said, you guys need to read more. And so I just mentioned this to, you, to some of you before. And, you know, and this was the amazing, this was such a typical situation. And so the, the response of the sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists is, oh, you need to read more and your students should read more so that you understand better. And the response of the designers was, well, you know what? We don't understand that way. We understand through other means. And it's a different type of knowledge. It's a different type of understanding. And this is really important when this dialogue begins to take place. So what they did here basically is in order to understand what happened is they engaged people not just then in gathering the knowledge of how this has evolved, which is what I called earlier the abductive reconstruction, but in actually then saying, if you were to do it now, or if you wanted to scale this up, or if you wanted to move this to something else, what would you do? And so then weeks of these workshops and studios move this uh, uh, whole uh, interaction to propositional thinking. And propositional meaning, you know, you have to put, by the end of this day, you have to put something on the table, and it has to be a proposal. And so, in that time limit, and that frame of the studio, this is, this is basically studio culture, right? Everyone who went through any design studio knows what that means. What that meant is that they did then grouped, in groups, critiqued these proposals. And this group critique, in fact, is very analogous to what a critique in social sciences, or, and of course in humanities, have traditionally been the means of, produ of producing knowledge, new knowledge, critique. And the, and the critique is in design schools never understood as an opportunity to produce new knowledge. It is always, always understood in pejorative terms. It's like, oh, you know, da, 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 da. But it's not that. that that's why I said I'm never negative. Because, in fact, the, this is the site of the production of knowledge. The studio critique is when we produce new knowledge. But we need to frame it that way in order to get there. And so this was framed that way, and that's why it's extremely interesting. And that's, wh that's when it begins to move the discourse be be uh, beyond here is social science, here is design, to like, so what do we think now that we have a proposal on the table? My colleague and friend, Vajan Tirao, anthropologist, she said before she started working with designers, and she did the project in Mumbai, years ago, and she said, what I, really, what I really learned is that the moment we, and actually they worked in the community, she worked in prior as an anthropologist. She observed, she worked with them, da, da, da. But the moment these designers arrived, they immediately wanted to do something, and they put the proposal on the table. And she said, that community immediately started, you know, going like, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is, this can't be. It's like, why? No, no, this can't be. So everything was like, yes, but. Yes, but, yes, but. And she said what she understood from that experience is that she would never have understood from working alone as an anthropologist because she would never have this kind of engagement. And so she said, when you put the proposition on the table, you understand the deeply seated motivations and beliefs. And this is precisely, th these are these openings, uh, these are the openings where I have three minutes, okay. All right, well then in that case, uh, now it's going to be a closing. I just talked about openings, now I need to close. This is the work of Teddy Cruz. Uh, these are his diaries, this is the thing that I talked about, uh, some uh, disambiguation. What he did is he traveled for a long time through Latin America and through all of the places we all know them now, all of the places where some innovation happened, urban innovation, whether it's transport, whether it's crime, whether it's whatever it is, Bogota, Medellin, da da da, and so uh, Brazil. And then uh, he basically, I'll skip this whole thing. So he basically then came up with uh, this, uh, the visualizations of how this, the, the specific tropes of urban knowledge uh, in relation to governments, management, and so forth, how they began to travel across Latin America and how each time something else was added to it. And so he basically then created this diagram, which I find really incredible. 
you can see it, obviously, I understand. Uh, you can see the details, but it's a, it's, a, it's a table of elements, and it's basically his way of trying to say, this is what happened in Medellin. So the, the project was, in fact, had three, it, even the actual people who were involved did not, underst did not understand that this was coming, right? So constructing the political, designing governance, and spatializing citizenship. And so these are the three categories under which there are all of these subcategories through which this project actually took place. This is what I meant by abductive um, uh, uh, reconstruction. This is um, a project of the uh, Deborah Gunn's Gun Studio in uh, New York City. This actually is a, a wonderful uh, project uh, that I don't have the time to explain now. Um, but uh, this project is uh, what I what I wanted to say is going clicking it a little bit to policy issues and so on and so forth. After Sandy, the biggest problem in in areas uh, uh, where affected by San Hurricane Sandy was that you could only apply for reconstructing your property as an individual. So if you had a community that had a specific spatial and material configuration that wanted that needed to be preserved. For, your, for the social tissue to maintain, for their relationship to maintain. They had a special arrangements in this particular area. They had the court captains. They had the neighborhood organizations and so on and so forth. Very specific way of organizing the place, which worked very well. And so you had to apply as an individual. So the problem when they came there, she's, she teaches at Pratt, so this is the Pratt Community Development Center. So when they came there, uh, they understood that, if the, that these people are completely disabled by the destruction and by the new policies and by the existing funding streams. So what they did is they set out to, des to design a scheme that will basically enable them to apply for funding and get the funding they got it, to then reconstruct uh, by new means, new technology, and so on and so forth, get the funding to do also the whole reconstruction, and then, in other, and then at the end, in fact, to preserve to absolutely preserve the essential social fabric of this neighborhood, of this entire, of this thing, which is a beautiful, beautiful project. I'm sorry, I don't have the time to explain. Very complex project, ecologically, socially, uh, uh, very, very uh, complex project. I just want to sh mention these people. I'm not gonna, I, I promise. So this is the Center for Urban Pedagogy. Center for Urban Pedagogy is a wonderful organization in New York City. They do, uh, they basically uh, translate policy through design and visual means, the comp very complex policy to citizen groups who are illiterate, um, uh, do not speak English. As I said, a lot of people actually in New York City do not have English prof basic English proficiency. Um, people who have no access to any kind of uh, government agent or agency. And so what they do is through workshops and pamphlets and what they call the kits, uh, toolboxes. They basically work with community organizers in order to create, it takes two years to develop each of these. What they do is work with these organizations to develop a kit that would be basically explain to citizens what, not only how the policy in relation to, for example, zoning or affordable housing works, but also what is their role in the process and how they can, in fact, participate, take part and change the system eventually, change the top-down policy if that's, that is one of the community organizers. And then this one is, uh, this one is, I want to mention the name, Hester Street Collaborative. And Hester Street is another wonderful organization uh, that does differently. Their role, literally, is to link uh, citizen organizations and community-based organizations with the government. And so they work, the third, third sec, typical third sector organization, non-profit organization, and what they do is they employ design to do that. Unfortunately, I don't have the time. I will not say read the book, but I, I, I just don't have the time to now explain this. Um, amazing projects they did for, with all kinds of uh, departments of city, uh, um, city plan, urban planning and uh, uh, parks and recreation. And this is the beautiful project, People's Plan for East River, uh, East River Waterfront, uh, where they basically sidelined the development uh, that was supposed to be Richard Rogers' uh, development along the um, um, East River and they uh, simply uh, cultivated the support and uh, stopped the project and basically created this people's plan for um, East River Waterfront, uh, a very beautiful project. And then uh, finally, some of, some of the things, uh, uh, the third section, the design in, uh, govern, in governance, oh sorry, in city um, uh, offices, as many of you may know, uh, the city of Boston actually has this uh, new urban mechanics uh, um, um, office, started by uh, the previous legendary mayor of Boston, who, uh, who basically wanted to bring uh, digital literacy 
um, creativity, design, if you will, and policy uh, governance, sorry, uh, together. And so what they did is call, check them out. Uh, they have a website, beautiful website. They did an incredible number of very, very interesting attempts to do just that. Uh, this is Mexico City, the City Lab in Mexico City, again started a couple of years ago. Huge creative space with a lot of young people, uh, architects, designers, planners, and so on and so forth, who are engaged in creating opportunities for, uh, again, connecting the city with, uh, with uh, the youth. And then uh, the Mind Lab, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, and Christian Basin, who actually wrote a beautiful book recently published by Ashgate on design and governance and, and their mutual links. Okay, that's that. I will skip this. Okay, thank you.